Thank you. I'd now like to recognize Ms. Rice for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Bonzanto, although the VA has procedures for investigating whistleblower complaints, um, these procedures have allowed the program office or facility where a whistleblower reported misconduct to conduct the investigation. Um, so GAO even found instances in which managers investigated themselves for misconduct. How do you plan on um, addressing this issue going forward to ensure independence in the report, in the investigation, and um, that things are, you know, done in an unbiased way? That um, for OAWP, we investigate all allegations re related to retaliation. We also investigate allegations into senior leadership, poor performance, and management. We do have the authority, similar to SE, to refer cases back to the administration. Part of improving our processes internally is we have developed que a questionnaire. We're working on a questionnaire to basically triage these cases to ensure that we're not referring cases back to the program office where a manager who is involved in the case is going to be part of that investigation. Right. So it's improving my internal training for my staff and also creating these templates where they can have a checklist of standard questions to go through to, again, improve anonymity and improve communication and ensure that people who are involved in the allegation are not part of the investigations. Um, I mean, that's good because I know that we've heard before about a f level of frustration on the part of whistleblowers that they're, it's hard to have an unbiased approach when the person heading the investigation is involved. Right. Um, so one of the other um, What we heard, and it was really disturbing in the last hearing, um, how actions taken by the VA against whistleblowers follow them for the rest of their careers and impact their future employment opportunities if they were to leave. Um, but it doesn't seem to be the case for the more senior level employees who retaliate against them. So one issue that um, I'd be interested to hear yours and anyone else's feedback on that I, I think speaks to addressing the cultural issue um, and holding senior level employees accountable is how relevant information or documentation on instances of whistleblower retaliation or substantiated misconduct is shared across um, the VA at the leadership and facility levels. And if a senior level employee had been implicated in a whistleblower retaliation disclosure, but no official action had been taken against them for misconduct, is this type of information shared across the VA? And if not, do you think it should be? Are you, to clarify, you're speaking about if the, an individual, there's a claim against retaliation that yeah. we substantiate. Um, if there is a recommendation regarding that, we have to report back if the uh, the recommendation coming out for disciplinary action regarding recommend, um, retaliation is not followed. We actually have to share that information back. I report directly to the secretary so leadership is aware if that doesn't happen. Um, well, I mean, it just, it just seems that there is, there, there are more negative, there's a much more, um, a much greater negative impact on the whistleblowers, obviously, right. than the, the people who retaliate against them. There doesn't seem to be that much accountability at the higher levels in the VA for actions they may take against a whistleblower versus the sometimes career-ending impact it has on the whistleblowers themselves. So how do you, how can we make that a more consistent across the board? I mean, the, 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 the whole culture of the VA starts at the top, and if people in higher positions are not being held accountable when whistleblowers are actually having you know, a much larger impact, professional and personal impact. How do we address that inconsistency there? Part of our office when we're talking about disciplinary action is to actually track those, and that's part of the data analysis we have to do. So we'll be able to identify those areas where a leader is refusing to take action against someone who's, you know, claining, who, who has an allegation, uh, substantiated allegation. So can you, so is this something that you're just starting to try to get information on? Right. This is something, so I've been um, in the office for six months, so this is something that's important and critical, and the committee has also said that we, we want to know where these data points are. 
Um, so and how are you going about com um, compiling that information? It's through recommendations for disciplinary action. Um, when we give a recommendation for disciplinary action, if those actions are not taken, that's something we have to track within our office. So can we, you'll obviously be sharing those yes. results with us yes. too. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I'd like to... Let us move on to uh, Ms. Rice for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you all for coming here to testify tonight. Um, so I want to talk about um, an issue that I, I don't think that we can adequately address the issue of suicides amongst veterans without talking about guns, firearms. Um, if you look at, uh, there's no question that firearms are one of the most common means of completing suicide among the general population, and 69% of veterans have completed suicide via firearm. Women veterans are also more likely to utilize firearms in the attempt and or completion of suicide than their civilian counterparts. It's been proven that restricting access to firearms may reduce suicide rates. So this is for anyone on the panel. Um, has the VA studied gun violence in the veteran population? What research is currently available on gun violence in connection to suicide? I'm well aware that we as a body, Congress, has not um, been willing to fund a study to look at the overall reason for the epidemic of gun violence in this country. But since we're talking about the VA, I'm specifically asking about the VA. Is this an issue that warrants more research to shed light on why firearms are the most um, common means utilized? And what resources does VA offer to veterans that may choose to limit their access to firearms? So anyone to, who wants to answer that? Well, to, to, to put it in a national context, let me mention a couple of things. So 51% of all suicides in America utilize a firearm. So it is clearly a very important issue. The collaborative safety plan that uh, Dr. Avinovoli uh, spoke to includes as part of that paying attention to access to lethal means when working with an individual who is suicidal. Um, that frequently may includes firearms, can also include things like um, access to large amounts of pharmaceuticals or other dangerous uh, substances. Uh, SAMHSA, uh, through our Suicide Prevention Resource Center, has an online course on counseling about access to lethal means. Again, this is within the context of someone who's suicidal and trying uh, to reduce access to lethal means on a temporary basis. And then finally, I would mention that a number of our SAMHSA grantees are doing work um, with uh, a firearm owning groups and things like what it's called the Gunshot uh, Gun Shop Project, working um, with them and um, and with other groups to try to have a collaborative effort to educate about suicide warning signs so that people know how to respond. And the only other thing that I would add from the VA side, we're working hand in hand with SAMHSA on many of those initiatives that Dr. McEwen spoke about. We also train our mental health providers with a special training on access to lethal means and how to talk with veterans about this issue. We do have a partnership with the National Shooting and Sports Foundation, and this is a partnership that helps us ex ex execute trainings in local communities with gun shop owners on signs and symptoms of suicide risk. And then we, we do work on this issue around putting time and space between the person at risk and any means that's lethal, and certainly firearms are the top means in our population, as you note, but equally so medication and a ho host of other issues around this topic. Dr. Stone, you mentioned before you used the word ineligibility. Uh, and to me, I just think it is the most insane policy that there is any man or woman who wore the uniform of this country and is, I don't care what they did, is ineligible for some kind of, for access to health care. Um, I, I, I wonder, Dr. Stone, if you can tell us what uh, specific risk other than honorable discharges represent because of their limited access to VA mental health care uh, services, specifically women veterans who are more likely to have experienced MST, uh, are also more likely to have received a bad paper discharge as retaliation for reporting MST um, before the two-year mark when they would be eligible for VA health care. So I think this is an issue that we need to talk about in terms of, I, I just don't think that there should be a veteran and ineligibility should never go hand in hand. 
I think, Congresswoman, you're exactly correct. And one of the big problems that we have, as the chairman identified in his uh, opening statement, is never activated guardsmen and reservists. They'd never been called to federal service, so technically they're not a veteran. And I'm not eligible to welcome them into the system. Now, we've tried to overcome that by using our vet centers and combining, and we've worked very successfully with the Guard Bureau and the Army Reserve to try and move our vet centers on a mobile basis into drill weekends. But many of the suicides we're seeing in never activated guardsmen and reservists uh, are between age 35 and 54. So they're long since their service days. And how to reconnect with them or to give us the authority to engage them, uh, it seems to me that if I can accept uh, veterans with other than honorable paper, we ought to be able to accept the uh, never activated guard and reserve who account for uh, about two and a half to three of the daily suicides that we're seeing. Thank you, Dr. Stern. I think it's a conversation we should continue to have. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Rice. Those are really great questions.